Okay, 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 I know the thumbnail was a little harsh, but I think we can do a little better with mundane weapons in fifth edition. Let's talk about it. Welcome back to the channel, everybody. My name is Garmin. This, of course, is the Storycraft Society, and this week I have been thinking a lot about mundane weapons in 5th edition. Now, this is going to be a video a la Dale Kingsmill, where I'm kind of throwing a lot of thoughts out at y'all, and I would love to hear your responses back. Am I way off base here? Am I really onto something? So bear with me. I really do think that the video does end up going somewhere uh, pretty awesome. So the first thing that I have to say is that mundane weapons in 5th edition really don't get the star treatment. I would actually go so far as to say they get, well, they're just boring. I wish that I didn't feel that way, but certainly I do. Now there's a couple of special items that are really nice, like the trident or the net that get some cool special abilities. Tridents being able to be used in water easier or nets that can be used to trap somebody. But for the most part, most of the items are what damage die does it do? That's what it does. Maybe a couple of restrictions here and there, but that really sucks. I, I mean, just plain and simple, I, I guess I do agree with the thumbnail in that regard. And I can think of a few reasons why, right? Number one, I'm gonna talk about my role players at the table, right? The role players, when you give them the difference between a short sword and a scimitar, let's use that as an example, right? There's no benefit to one over the other. The only difference is the scimitar is more expensive. So the role player can certainly add their own flavor to it and they can get their juice out of it. They wanna act and they want to describe what their character is doing when they swing their weapons and why they would choose a scimitar over a short sword. but. That's unfair to them because they're working hard to role play and make the experience better for everybody. And unfortunately, the weapons in the player's handbook just don't give a lot of cool flavor for players to expand on or newer role players, right? That, that aren't super comfortable making something out of nothing, right? Number two, power gamers get nothing out of this weapon system. The mundane weapons in the player's handbook for a power gamer basically come down to numbers. And is that? Fine, sure, and I'm sure there's some power gamers out there that really enjoy that, but the power gamers at my table end up saying things like, why would you take the scimitar instead of the short sword? You're just gonna pay more money for it and it does the same thing. The third and final reason, and I think maybe the worst reason, is that there is a mechanic that is built into the monster manual and into the mechanics of fifth edition that certain monsters are scary solely because they have resistance to or are immune to non-magical piercing, bludgeoning, and slashing damage. So, if you give them a whole bunch of magic items early, and I'm talking third, fourth, fifth level, ghosts and lichens all become a lot less scary, and I would like them to stay scary a little bit longer. I do wanna bring up another two issues that I think the crappy mundane weapons cause when I've been playing more games. So, one of them is that PCs get gold. They want to go to a city or a village or whatever and spend that gold. And then when they go to look at the magic item shop, they see that the weapons are 10,000, 20,000 gold, and that's just a, a cost that they don't have. And then they always get disappointed. Obviously, that's what you want to reach towards. That's the thing that you would like to get eventually. But can't we find a way to make our players happy spending their gold in towns, you know, for stuff in the player's handbook or maybe a little better than what's in the player's handbook, right? Another issue that is just an obvious one, and I'm not gonna go into it because it's just so obvious, is power creep. You give your level four players each a magic weapon, that makes that party a lot more strong. Not just a little bit more strong, it makes them a lot more strong. So with all that said, uh, hopefully you're still with me, let's start talking about what my solutions are that will help to fix this problem and I think will allow all the DMs out there to get really creative with the mundane items that they either give or allow their players to buy. Okay, so the first solution that I see most common and that I see a lot of DMs using is flavor text. Now, I think that flavor text is essential when giving your players magic items or mundane items or any kind of item, right? Take a paragraph and just explain in detail what that item looks like. It will make your players take it more seriously and it will help paint a more vivid 
picture in their mind. The issue with mundane items is that this doesn't do us a whole lot of good, basically because the players will just start to ignore that text if the text is the only thing that you give them. And eventually that's just gonna train your players to ignore the flavor text, and that is not what we wanna do. So flavor text is important, but I don't think that that's a good solution here. So I'm gonna jump into what I think the solutions could be, and then I'll give examples of some items that I use in my game that I think will help you to understand them maybe a little better, or if I do a terrible job of explaining, it'll make a little more sense. I'm gonna dive in here and pull up my chart of example things to add to mundane weapons in fifth edition. And actually, it's worth me saying, you could also add this to armor, you could add this to, to, to anything if you wanted to. So this chart I separated into benefits and effects. For example, the first benefit is better crafted mundane weapons. So this is actually a pretty common idea. I think it'll be easy to understand, but that if you have a mundane weapon, a non-magical weapon, you could easily add a plus one to attack and damage rolls because it was crafted by a better weaponsmith than just a sword crafted at a blacksmith in some village or something like that, right? Plus one to attack and damage rolls, but no magical benefit. So going up against a ghost or a lichen, it's not going to change the fight from it just being a regular player's handbook weapon. And now your players feel like they've got something a little better. And you could take that up to plus one, plus two, plus three, if you really wanted to. This is just a master crafted weapon by one of the best non-magical smiths in the whole world. And that keeps that you know, scaling, but also why would they choose to use the plus one magic weapon over the plus three non-magical weapon? Well, going up against a ghost, you gotta swing what you gotta swing. Now, this actually is a really good side note because there's other items in the player's handbook like the whetstone that are completely, completely unnecessary. I have players that role play with them and flavor that they buy a whetstone so that they can sharpen their sword, but that really doesn't do anything. You could take this and use that, you know, to the player's advantage. If they take part of a long rest or short rest to use a whetstone on their weapon, they can add for 10 hours or eight hours or 24 hours if you're really nice, a plus one to that weapon just because they're making it sharper. And then over time, it'll dull back to a regular weapon. That's a neat way that you can use some of the other items. I might do a video on that as well. Mundane items in the player's handbook to make them a little bit more useful and flavorful as well. But let's go to the next one. So the next one is tangible and mechanical. That's really important. Role-playing flavor. The effect would be it adds a role-playing ability to a weapon based on cultural significance, some kind of special quirk to the weapon or something like that. So for example, I have a stiletto that I allow players to take in my game. Now that's a martial weapon and it only does a D3 of damage, but the benefit that it has is that anytime you make a dexterity sleight of hand check to hide that weapon, you have advantage on the roll. Does that change this mundane item? Does it blow my game apart? No, but it does give a very good reason why a rogue character would choose to have a stiletto over a regular dagger. Another example is maybe one of my favorite examples ever, and this is something that I actually took out of the Warlock Grimoire here, but it's silk-backed coin mail. And I'm not gonna go into a huge long thing about this, but I'm gonna jump over to my map real quick. All right, so to explain this silkback coin mail, I'm gonna have to jump up to my map. I'm very proud of it, and hopefully you enjoy this quick little discussion. So, over on the western coast of the continent of Trasina, there are two nations. There is Drosea and there is Prejav. Prejav is a nation of very, like, Prussian, no-nonsense kind of folk, and then Drosea is actually the exact opposite. Drosea is very flamboyant and over the top, and it matters more how you do something than the result of it. A good way that I described Drosea is like, if you go deposit money in a bank, the bank teller will yell out to the people who are there how much money you're depositing, because that's culturally relevant to them, right? That it's not that you're depositing money, it only matters that you're depositing money in other people. No. In Drosea, they're like elite knights wear this silk-backed coin mail. Now, just as a reminder, I did get this idea from Cobbled Press's Warlock series, so I'm not taking full credit for this one, but I did expand on it and add it to my world, and that's why I love those books so much, right? Also, just quick plug, if these books are at all interesting to you, I have a video where I review them 
I did this a couple of months ago. Go check it out. In Drosea, uh, the elite knights wear this silk-backed coin mail, which is literally uh, Drosean silk underneath coin mail over top that jingles like crazy when you wear it. And the Droseans love it because it's very showy and over the top. And when two fighters are fighting and they're wearing silk back coin mail, it makes this cool jingling sound through the whole fight. They love it. Well, the Prajavi people to the north hate it. I think this is another really cool use of giving something tangible and mechanical role playing flavor. The silk back coin mail gives you a plus two bonus to all status when dealing with Drosaeans. But if you're dealing with anyone from Prejav, you have a negative two to those rolls. And so that's a really good example of a mundane item that has cultural significance that Drosaeans love it, the Prejavi hate it. It's just a cool way that you can soup up a mundane item. Now, of course, the silk back coin mail is armor, but like I said, this applies to weapons and armor as well. So. Anyway, long. Also, isn't this map like the sickest? So good. Daniel, that's the artist. Good looking out, my man. If you're still with me because I just ranted for so long about parts of my world that I love, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's go back to the other thing. So the next one is special non-magic combat abilities. Now the key word here is non-magic because this will add a special non-magical combat ability to a weapon due to the historical use of that weapon. So for example, a gisarm is like a glaive but with a big hook at the end, right? You could easily add a trip attack to that weapon. Why would a player choose to use the gisarm instead of a glaive? Well, now once per turn, they can use that hook to make a trip attack against an enemy. How does that benefit the role player? Well, now they have a very specific thing that they can describe their character doing when they're fighting the goblins in the tunnels. How does that help the power gamer? Well, now they've got options cool options that they could either make a regular attack or trip something to give their allies an attack with advantage because they're prone. Now then my final one is maybe more of kind of opening the door, which is where I want to end this video, but that it could be part of a set. Now we have sets of magical items, but there could easily be sets of non-magical items that the more a character is decked out in this particular set, the more they have some kind of sway over cultures or that sort of thing, very similar to the silk back coin mail did. That's where the door opens, I think, where I kind of end this video with an open question. This is what I've been thinking about. What do you think? I would love to hear in the comments down below that we can start kind of sharing with each other ways to make mundane weapons in fifth edition that much better. This is just scratching the surface. These you know, four quick ideas, get the ball rolling for something that would end up being really, really cool. Hopefully all of this information was fun. It was super fun for me to think about and talk about. I hope that you get something out of it and I hope to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. But if you enjoyed this video, definitely leave me a like. Share this video with a friend that you think would enjoy it. That helps a small YouTube channel a lot. Subscribe if you haven't. There's gonna be lots more videos like this. We have a huge back catalog of videos that you can go check out. Say hello if you're new. I would love to meet each and every one of you in person, but digitally is just as good. Well, almost as good. But with that said, that's all I have for this week. Until next week, I'll be seeing you.